Come on in. Yeah. <laughs> We're just testing the mic. I think it's pretty good. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Sharon Stevens, and I'm super proud to be here and presenting this show for, for all of you. Show. I don't know what else to call it. Um, so I'm the artist in residence here at the 1886 Sea Space uh, Eau Claire. I'm here for three weeks in a project called Artifact or Fiction. Uh, there's postcards at the door for the remainder of the events, and this is one of the events that I've programmed, and I'll get started on that in a minute. You want to hold it up, Brenda? Absolutely. This is Brenda Fox. Brenda's for hire. Yeah. Brenda, well, not only does Brenda do this, Brenda manages the sound, and um, there's an AV, an audiovisual viewing station back here. Some of you may recognize the old format. Um, so Brenda's helped me set that up as well. So if you're ever looking for AV, Brenda's your gal. Um, a couple more things I want to come on in. Great, Harry, come on in. I need what you have in your hands. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So, um, this is Sebastian Key. <laughs> Sorry, Harry. <laughs> now everybody knows. Um, and, and it's this key here. It's a little bit tricky, so don't leave it to the last minute. Um, it's a beautiful bathroom uh, for anyone who's curious. Um, it's warm. There's running water, flushing toilets. The, the, sh the light should be on. And I, the key is kept over there in that little closet. Is it around the back? Is it around the back? Yes. All right. Logistics. Wi Fi, there is Wi Fi here as well. The, the long password is there, so you can probably even do your banking safely here. Uh, and then there's some hashtags. Please add hashtags if you're going to do any kind of social media posting. Uh, also, sign the book, please, when you leave. C Space is, of course, gathering stats. They don't want your contact info, don't worry about that. Uh, just your name to show you were here. And it helps to make sure that this kind of activity keeps going on in our city. Um, take a globe. These are my globes. And I've activated them and animated them and kept them for years. And now they're going to go to new homes. Yeah. Uh, so please, please feel free to take a parting gift. Uh, the other thing that I've worked on in my history is um, the Equinox Vigil in the Union Cemetery. So lots of folks here know that I do work in uh, death and dying and grief and loss and mourning and doing uh, rituals and creative artistic ways of expressing our community grief. And so uh, an artist named Victoria Sanchez, boy, there she is. Uh, Victoria has worked with me at, on Equinox and she designed this beautiful shrine. Um, these are my dead people. I've had, you know, like we all do, we get funeral cards and keep them. I can't keep them anymore. So please add yours if you come back. Um, there's also a piece of paper there. You can write the um, names of your deceased so that they'll all get put together. And then at the end of this residency, I'm going to burn them. Um, just in a ceremony of saying goodbye, another goodbye. Um, and then there's some Equinox Vigil pamphlets there to help you understand what we did. There's also some paraphernalia there. Essentially, I'm starting to think of this as Sharon Stevens' antique roadshow. <laughs> uh, I've been working in the city for 40 or 40 years um, as an activist and an artist, and so I was through a grant from the Calgary Arts Development and through uh, Alberta Foundation for the Arts, I was able to hire an archivist who's touched every piece of paper that I have and has helped me to catalog it. So it's going to be ingested, or what, what was the word you used? A session. A session. Uh -oh. So, <laughs> uh, So yeah, there's warm drinks there and water at the back. I think that's probably all the logistics that I want to tell you about. But I do want to welcome you here to this building, and Daryl's going to give you some history about it. But I also wanted to acknowledge that we are on Blackfoot territory, Calgary, Mokinsis. Right there is the Bow River, flows down to the Elbow, and that's where Elbow and Bow River 
where from time immemorial, people have been telling stories. So I'm really proud to be here in this structure, uh, telling stories and animating this space. So I'm just gonna hand it over to Daryl Carew, who is a heritage conservation consultant. So Daryl, please. Um, uh, thanks Sharon, and uh, thanks everybody for uh, coming out. It's great to see some familiar faces and some not so familiar faces. So. Uh, I, I, I have cheat notes here, so I just want to start with that. Um, so I want to uh, tell you about, a bit about myself. I'm not a historian. I'm looking at Harry the historian there. So, uh, anyone else here, please uh, feel free to correct me if I uh, uh, make any mistakes. I'm not uh, great at dates. But I, I studied uh, uh, architecture, architectural history and architecture. And I worked in heritage conservation for over 30 years. I worked in the city of Calgary uh, first as a heritage planner, starting about 20 years ago. I set up the uh, uh, heritage planning program that's uh, been uh, growing uh, since I started. And then uh, seven years ago, I moved over to facilities management and set up a program to manage uh, 30 city-owned heritage buildings. And this is one of them. So that's when I really became uh, familiar with this, this building about uh, seven or eight years ago. Um, I left the city last November and I've been working as a uh, consultant since then. So when Sharon invited uh, me to do this and then I saw the theme of her uh, tenure here, I thought this was great, artifact or fiction. I've thought about historic buildings as artifacts. And then history, what is history? Is it real is just to me history is stories that people tell about buildings you know i've been researching this building and just in the little bit of research i've done i've found things contradictory bits of uh, information on the building here so we'll get started the building here uh, i told you about my involvement really started about uh, seven years ago when i uh, uh, started managing helping to manage city-owned heritage buildings um, so back then, the first thing I did when I started with facilities management, this building had blue tarps on the roof keeping the rain out. So we put a new roof on it in, uh, I think that was 2017 and 2019, we had it painted. And then uh, last year, I started, when I started working as a consultant, I started working as a sub-consultant for Dialogue Architects who are the prime consultant for the Eau Claire uh, renewal project that involves moving and rehabilitating this building. So I've been working uh, for Dialogue uh, since then. And part of the work I've done for Dialogue is I put together a formal evaluation of the building according to the Heritage Calgary protocols and standards. And I worked with uh, Marilyn Williams, another uh, heritage consultant on that, who helped me do some of the uh, research on this. And that's all uh, in advance of the building being put forward for actual protection and formal designation as a municipal heritage resource, which will happen sometime uh, next year once it's uh, moved to its final uh, resting place. So <clears throat> the building, why do we care about the building? Um, well, in uh, heritage conservation, we always talk about values. Why is the building valuable? And there's a formal matrix of values that you have to go through and assign certain values to it. And it's meant to be scientific and uh, objective rather than subjective. But of course, there's some subjectivity to this. So uh, this building, it's valued for, for its association with some uh, important people in Calgary's history that I'll talk uh, a bit about. It's uh, important for its association with early Calgary industry. And one of the most important early Calgary industries, and that was milling uh, lumber. It was also associated with uh, one of uh, Calgary's first power plants. Um, and you know, it, it gave the, uh, the community its name, uh, Eau Claire. And I'll talk a bit more about where that uh, name came from. But beyond its association with the early industry, it's actually been a uh, food and beverage service uh, building for longer than anything else. For almost 70 years, it's been used as a, uh, a, a cafe. And finally, it's uh, important as a representative example of a ver vernacular wood frame commercial building in Calgary's history. There's, 
uh, you know, I can only think of one other existing wooden commercial building from this early in Calgary's history. And again, I'll get to that a bit later. But so as I go through my talk, I'm going to be touch. I'm going to be bouncing all over the place. I've got a couple of, of asides in here, but I'm going to try to re relate most of what I talk about about uh, to these values that I've just talked about. So I want to uh, start by putting this uh, in uh, context. This is a view of the Rocky Mountains with the corner of uh, Fort Calgary on the side there. Uh, done by Richard Barrington Nevitt of the Northwest Mounted Police. And uh, something that I, I found that uh, people don't, well, the way I think about Calgary, Western Camp District, it was the wilderness. It was like the deepest, darkest wilderness, you know. I think the cliche of wilderness, people think of the Amazon or Africa, but this was the same kind of wilderness, you know. We didn't have elephants here, we had moose here. <laughs> we didn't have tigers, we have grizzly bears. We don't have meerkats, we had prairie dogs. So the people that came here at that time, they were like really adventurous, brave people to come to this uh, wilderness here. Um, first explored by David Thompson in 1787. <clears throat> of course, it was uh, home to First Nations for thousands of years, 7,000 years before that. So it's not like he was the, the first person to discover this land. There were people here long before David Thompson. It wasn't until 100 years later when the first white settler arrived in Calgary named John Glenn. Um, and he had a, a house in uh, Fish Creek that unfortunately it was a, a, it was salvaged and then it was lost at some point. After uh, John Glenn, it was the uh, uh, Father Lacombe, uh, uh, Catholic missionaries that set it, settled here, <clears throat> built a log cabin uh, on the Elbow River. The Mission neighborhood was a Roman Catholic settlement uh, initially. And then about the same time, 1875, was when uh, Inspector Brisebois established Fort Calgary out here with uh, uh, 50 Northwest Mounted Police, came out here to sort of fend off the whiskey traders that were coming up uh, from Montana and to establish a uh, formal Canadian presence. So what you're looking at now, again, I don't know if this is true, it's uh, reputed to be the first photograph ever taken in Calgary from 1878. And, uh, you know, uh, Sharon gave a, a land acknowledgement here, but I also want to acknowledge there is some First Nations history associated with this building. It's not my story to tell. I haven't been able to do the uh, First Nations engagement yet. I'm, you know, that I'll, I'll have to be doing that. But when C Space took over this space last year and they had an opening event, uh, Eldon Weasel Child, uh, uh, Blackfoot knowledge keeper and elderly uh, gave a blessing and told a few stories about the building. So I'll relate those to you. They're not my stories, they're second hand. But what I learned uh, then, I knew nothing about this, was the timber that was harvested was on First Nations land. And there's some, I haven't done the research, there was some indication or well, maybe they shouldn't have been harvesting that lumber. But on the other hand, what he did say it was a, there was some positive relationships with this building because some of the men from the reserve, the First Nations men, were hired to help harvest the lumber in the winter, which allowed them to get off the reserve, which wasn't always easy to do. And it also gave them some cash and some money that was desperately needed. And then in turn, they would come to this very building and purchase lumber supplies with the money they made. So I have a lot more to learn about that, but there is uh, some First Nations history with this site here. So this is uh, the year the uh, Eau Claire Lumber Company started. This was Calgary, it was a tent city. Like a lot of settlements in Western Canada, the first influx of people, it happened so quickly, they didn't have supplies, they had to uh, live in tents. So this was just east of the Elbow River. And just a few numbers here. There was this huge influx in the early part of Calgary's history. So 
1884, the population was about 4,000 people. By 1912, it was about 45,000. So in that short period of time, the population increased tenfold. If you can imagine now, Calgary's population increasing tenfold in the same period, it's just, it's unimaginable. So people lived in tents. If you were lucky, you'd live in a log cabin. This is the Hunt House, uh, uh, right next to the Dean House in uh, Inglewood, just across from Fort Calgary. And uh, it, it was a, a Métis cabin. You can see in the upper right-hand corner, this is what it looked like. Uh, and the Dean House was using it to store uh, empty beer bottles in. It had been a residence for a long time, but it wasn't then. And then in what year, in 2016, it was restored to what you see at the bottom there. Um, so this would have been one of the first uh, uh, wooden houses in Calgary, but it was logs because there was no uh, timber available. And when timber became available, this was uh, Stephen Avenue in uh, uh, 1885, you know, Mud Street's wood buildings. <clears throat> so they were building small wood buildings at the time. But the next year, this is a bit of an aside, uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of the Great Fire in Calgary in 1886. This is a phenomenon that happened in many, many places in Western North America. The Chicago Fire, perhaps the most uh, uh, well-known one. But this uh, uh, building destroyed 18 uh, buildings. And again, a bit more of an aside, at the time there was a dysfunctional city council. Uh, it was something about some uh, election list fraud, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, talk about history repeating itself. Um, and so this meant that the newly ordered chemical engine for the recently organized Calgary Fire Department was held uh, by the Canadian Pacific Railway Storage Yard due to lack of payment. Uh, so they couldn't. Uh, put the fire out as quickly as they uh, they might have. I read recently, you know, they tried to blow up some buildings to create fire breaks. Eventually, they were able to create a fire break. But as a result of this fire, that's what uh, led to Calgary becoming Sandstone City. After this, Calgary City, Cam City Council passed a bylaw that required all commercial buildings within certain areas of the city to be built with fireproof material, which meant brick or sandstone. And because sandstone was readily available, there were many buildings built of sandstone. So uh, it, it also, building buildings out of sandstone sort of set Calgary apart from other cities in Western Canada that were all trying to attract uh, settlers to uh, and immigrants to their city. So Calgary really l leaned into that and promoted itself as Sandstone City to differentiate itself from other places. So this was the, the only other wood frame commercial building of uh, the period on Stephen Avenue. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's the TC Power Company built in 1885. Uh, as a general store, it was also home to a furrier for many years, and it was uh, restored. It, it had been uh, remodeled, and the facade had been drastically changed, but it was restored to its original appearance, 1885 appearance, back in uh, 1996. So this is another uh, early shot of Calgary after the uh, tent city. So as soon as wood was available, of course, people started taking advantage of it and building a, a slightly more uh, permanent residences. Oops, where did I go? And just for a comparison, this is a uh, shot of Glasgow at the turn of the 19th century, just to uh, sort of compare and contrast what Calgary was like. So again, you think of the wilderness and the uh, courage of people to come and live, come from places like Glasgow and more uh, developed places to come to live in Calgary. <clears throat> so, uh, and again, th this uh, relates to the uh, uh, fiction part of history. Uh, you see on the slide here, I, can't, I think this slide says it's the first train arriving in Calgary. Well, it's not the first train arriving in Calgary. It's actually a special train carrying 
Lord Stanley departing Calgary in 1883. <clears throat> but it was a slide used by uh, Harold Riley in an illustrated lectures about uh, pioneer life, which he presented in Calgary schools. And uh, Harold Riley was a, a prominent early Calgary pioneer who uh, happened to be a, an MLA. So uh, uh, Mr. CC, you're in good company here uh, today. So, um, so now we're getting to the uh, 1886 15. This is uh, Isaac Kendall Kerr, who was uh, instrumental in uh, the establishment of the Eau Claire Lumber Company. But it was actually a, a lawyer in Ottawa named uh, Kudusoff McKee, or McPhee, sorry. Um, and when the train arrived here, he knew that Calgary was going to boom. He saw there was a real opportunity here for entrepreneurs and a, and a way to make some money. And he knew that lumber would be in huge demand. So what he did is he engaged uh, three individuals, uh, a Mr. Kerr, a Mr. Cameron, and a Mr. Donnellan <coughs> from Wisconsin, who came by rail to Calgary. And then they uh, traveled by a horse team uh, out to the area near Morley, where they uh, hired horses and some First Nations guy to explore the area around the Kananaskis River, uh, Morley, uh, headwaters of the Spray River and the Bow. They spent about two months exploring that area, area uh, to determine whether there was enough tim commercially uh, valuable uh, timber there. And so their results were favorable. So that uh, resulted in the formation of the Eau Claire and Bow, Li Bow River Lumber Company, which was actually an American company at the time, chartered by the state of Wisconsin and it remained an American company until uh, 1928. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, another one of the uh, uh, early uh, people that were instrumental in the, this lumber company, uh, uh, Kudasov uh, McPhee needed somebody to set up the mill. So he recruited Peter Prince from Eau Claire, Wisconsin. He had been born in uh, Trois-Rivières, Quebec, and he was a millwright. And a millwright is somebody who specializes in setting up equipment and machinery. So he had moved to Chicago for a while, and then he ended up in uh, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, working in a sawmill uh, in Wisconsin. And eventually there, he managed 500 employees at the Northwestern Lumber Company. And uh, Kudasov brought him to Calgary to uh, set up the mill here. So uh, just an aside, I'll talk a bit about more. So in addition to the lumber company, he set up one of the first power companies here in Calgary. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, so this is the Northwest Lumber Company in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, where Peter Prince worked. So it was a huge operation. Wisconsin was uh, had a whole number of lumber companies in Wisconsin around uh, Eau Claire, and this company was in Eau Claire, so hence the name here, Eau Claire, that uh, became the name of the lumber company, eventually the name of the neighborhood. And here are some of the princes in a buggy uh, in front of a uh, house that he built at 238 4th Avenue Southwest, just a few blocks from here near the mill so he could walk back and forth to work. And so this house became an artifact, and it's now housed at uh, Fort Calgary, can go and see it there, and just Harry's Park, so um, and just uh, incidentally, he Peter Prince also owned the first gas-powered car in Calgary in 1905, a Red Rambler, whatever that is. <laughs> so this is the uh, uh, timber plan where uh, timber was uh, uh, harvested from. So the uh, Dominion Land Surveyor named Louis Beaufort. Uh, surveyed and created these uh, uh, blocks um, or berths as they were called with a total area of uh, 1,200 square kilometers. And this was the biggest lumbering interest in Alberta prior to 1930 and where the operations began. So whoops. So this is the men who went out and harvested the lumber. Now, uh, they would uh, go out to this area and uh, harvest the lumber. I don't know who they were. I know that some of them were Norwegians. Um, 
uh, Peter Prince uh, in Wisconsin, they had uh, uh, convinced an uh, uh, experienced uh, lumberman from Norway to emigrate to uh, Wisconsin to work in the lumber industry there. Peter Prince convinced some of them to come to Calgary to work in the uh, Eau Claire lumber mill here. Um, now they were, this Norwegian community, they were all so sort of the nucleus of the community that founded the uh, Trinity Lutheran Church that was built in 1889 that's located just uh, uh, west of here on 8th Street and 3rd Avenue. And you can see some of the tools, typical tools that they use, the uh, crosscut saw, and uh, do any of you know what a PV is? It's a pole with kind of this spike gizmo at the end that you could use to manipulate and control logs. <clears throat> and here's a, uh, I think this is the Ghost River uh, camp that was uh, set up to harvest lumber. and. The lumber harvesting would uh, uh, take place in the winter. Uh, uh, a few more reasons for that, but this was uh, uh, attractive uh, for uh, people seeking employment because there wasn't as much employment in the winter. So this gave people work in the winter, and I mentioned some of the First Nations uh, that worked in some of these camps. Now here are some of the uh, these logs being uh, loaded up now. It was easier to harvest uh, lumber in the winter when the sap's not running. It's easier to uh, uh, fell the trees, and it's easier to move them around on sleds in the winter, although it was kind of tricky to load the sleds. And you can see here, there's some gizmos there, some A-frames and things there that you can just make out that uh, they use to get the uh, timber onto these carts. Um, they harvested mostly spruce, jack pine and some fir, eight to 16 inches in diameter, and then they would uh, cut it up into 12, 14, and 16 foot lengths before they loaded it up. And then they would stage it on the banks of the river in the winter, and they would stack it up on the banks of the river, waiting for the thaw in the summer, when they would uh, chop down the logs, hold them in place, and the logs would uh, fall into the river. So this was the beginning of the, the uh, uh, log drive. And here you see some of the log drivers. There'd be gangs of 30 to 40 men uh, moving all these logs down the river, one to three miles a day. Uh, uh, some, and sometimes these uh, rafts of logs or these groups of logs, they'd extend 10 miles down the river, moving at about three miles a day. And the drives continued from uh, 18, no, I don't know, I'm gonna make up a year. <laughs> All right? And anyways, the, the point I want to make, the, the, what I read in the research is the first year, the logs were brought in from Banff by train because they hadn't set up the log caps yet. So after that, they would, uh, uh, bring them in on these log drives on the river. In the first year, there were six, well, not the first year, in 1887, six log drivers were killed. They were in a boat that capsized. Uh, five bodies were recovered, and there's one uh, dead log driver out there somewhere that was uh, never recovered. So it was a dangerous, mm -hmm. uh, dangerous uh, job. So uh, here's a, a couple more uh, log drivers. And this is a still from it. Uh, so I'm sure some of you are familiar with the uh, NFB short, the log driver's waltz. Well, this is a little still from the log driver's waltz. So, and in that, you can see them, people jumping around from log to log. They had incredible balance and athletic skills to be able to do this and push these logs around with these long poles and uh, manipulate them down the river. So, now we get to the building. It's not this building, this was the first office building built for the lumber operation. Um, don't know exactly what year, but you can see the horse and buggies uh, in front. Very simple, simple flat roof building, but they needed a, a, an office. And here it is again, and you can see the beginning of the mill operation with a, a few buildings surrounding it. Here's the uh, building again. And, there's uh, three people and three early employees. There was uh, Charles Carr, Margaret Ide, and 
Theodore Strom were early uh, employees. And Theodore Strom uh, was uh, one of the employees of the Eau Claire Lumber Company, or the Lumber Company in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, who came here. So he helped build the mill and uh, set up the machinery. And the machinery was shipped out here from Eau Claire. So they put it on a rail car to Winnipeg, and then eventually it made its way here. But there's a, a really, uh, politically incorrect uh, narrative that uh, uh, Mr. Strom left that's in the uh, uh, Calgary archives where he uh, talks about some of his uh, early adventures working for the Eau Claire Lumber Company. And one of the stories he tells is he found a keg of whiskey floating in the river. And the, he surmised that, you know, smugglers, if they're about to get caught, they ditch their whiskey over the side of their boats or into the river, and he recovered this uh, barrel of whiskey that he wanted to sell it for $50, which was a huge amount of money back then, but uh, you know, he was overruled, and I think it was uh, probably just uh, poured out. So um, what you're looking at here, again, this is uh, uh, held in the Eau Claire uh, Company Fonds, at the uh, Glenville Archives. And these bonds, they include the original 1886 license, early correspondence, balance sheets, tax records, lists of employees, account books, plans, maps, etc. So from this map here, you can see in the bottom there, mm -hmm. right, what's the date on it? It's 1908. And the footprint of that building looks like this building. So we haven't been able to establish exactly when this uh, building was built, but perhaps uh, 1908, certainly by 1912, uh, the building was here. And uh, in this drawing, you can also see some of the other bil uh, buildings associated uh, with the mill operation. And here's a close-up. And this, uh, this is a fire insurance map from 1914. Are you all familiar with fire insurance maps? Not everyone. These were detailed maps that insurance companies would put together, uh, and they were made all across North America. And they would record buildings, the material sizes, the materials they were built of, where the nearest fire hydrant or fire station was done, and allowed them to calculate, help, help them to calculate insurance rates. So, for historians and building historians, they're an invaluable source of information. But this uh, one uh, uh, shows the, uh, the early uh, 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 hydro power station. So early on, Peter Prince saw a need for power and built the first uh, uh, power plant in Calgary. So again, this uh, map from 1908 shows what appears to be the footprint of uh, the building we're in right now. So I mentioned uh, before how critical lumber was. Um, so it was so critical that a lot of early settlements had some form of sawmill. They could be quite small, quite portable, but there was a huge need uh, for lumber. And they, these small mills could be quite set up easily. They were relatively uh, portable. Uh, so at its peak, the uh, Eau Claire Lumber Mill here produced three carloads of lumber today or about a million board feet a week. So a board foot is a board one foot wide, one foot long, one inch thick. So a million board feet would stretch, I did the math, it would stretch from here to Edmonton, if you uh, lay them out end to end. So they supplied a lot of lumber, and they supplied most of the lumber for 100 miles around here. And you can imagine anywhere south of here, lumber was scarce. And sometimes farmers or settlers, they'd have to travel five days to either get to a forest to harvest their own lumber or to get to Calgary to buy lumber. Um, so it was a really valuable commodity. And like I said, one of the most important early industries. Here I've just got some uh, examples of why it was in such a demand. I talked about the population explosion, but this is the uh, grandstands at the Calgary Stampede. Mm -hmm. You can see a lot of lumber uh, uh, going into this. And then this is the uh, uh, RCMP barracks. Again, uh, a lot of lumber uh, went into this. You can see the, the old Fort Calgary at the left. 
And again, uh, this is the horse show building on the exhibition at uh, exhibition grounds at uh, Calgary Stampede Moor Lumber and houses. This was the uh, Clipsham House uh, located at 1028 Memorial Drive. And um, he, uh, a person with basic carpentry skills could build a house like this. And Clipsham was an early uh, uh, Calgary carpenter and uh, uh, contractor. And the other thing, it wasn't timber, but it was wood. Wood was really important for heating and cooking. This is a, a typical homestead kitchen. Uh, this is at Heritage uh, uh, Park as well. So typically a homestead, they use up to five cords of wood a year to, uh, to heat and fuel their stoves. So uh, the city of Calgary has a, a great uh, collection of imagery on the web website that anyone can access. And they have a great collection of air photos of Calgary. So you can go on the web and find these. And this is one from 1920, which was near the height of production. And I think you can see there, I'll point it out, uh, just over here, huge, huge amount of uh, uh, stacked lumber uh, in the lumber yard. And you can also see uh, the channel that separates uh, Princess Island uh, from uh, mainland uh, Calgary. Originally, that channel didn't go all the way through. So one thing Peter Prince and his employees had to do, they had to dredge and blast that uh, channel out to make it a proper channel so the water would uh, uh, flow right through it. And eventually, you know, Prince's Island, named after Peter Prince. Uh, the family owned it until 1947. And again, fact or fiction, I'm not sure, but based on the research I did. So the family either sold the island or donated the island to the city of Calgary, which uh, uh, the city then developed it as a park. So uh, just another map showing the power plant and the dam. So uh, Prince established the Calgary Water Power Company and secured a contract for street lighting in Calgary. Again, an uh, anecdote is that uh, Peter Prince was walking one night in downtown Calgary and tripped and fell off the sidewalk because it was so dark. So he figured Calgary needs street lights. So they, they built the first hydro plant and got a 10-year exclusive contract to provide power to the city of Calgary. Eventually, uh, the, this company was uh, uh, taken over by what uh, today is uh, TransAlta. So that's what happened here. Oops, sorry, I clicked the wrong thing. Yeah, another another shot. Um, another shot of the power plant uh, showing showing the uh, uh, sluice skates. Uh, this is a. a uh, just a colored postcard. There, now, and I, I couldn't quite sort this out from the research I done. I, I did. They, they also ran generators on this site to provide power. And the generators were uh, steam generators powered by uh, waste sawdust from the plant. So I'm not sure how that relates to the overall uh, power supply on the company here. Again, another uh, close-up of the uh, uh, power plant. And just, I, I didn't uh, mention this uh, before, but incidentally, Peter Prince also built one of the first bridges across the Bow River. Uh, near, I think Harry, correct around near where the Louise Bridge is, I believe it was a, it was a wooden bridge because before there was a ferry, it was very difficult to get it across the river. So, re, re, uh, the, the power plant was just at, uh, down there. And, and the dam as well? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so they created a, a little dam to create a, a drop in water that they could use to uh, generate power to power the plant. So, you know, it's, I think it would, be, would have just been west of the Jaipur, where the Jaipur bridge is mm -hmm. now. Okay. Now, this is the earliest photo from 1928 that I found of the existing building. And uh, in the archives, it's referred to as the Eau Claire Lumber Mill Office and Cash Warehouse. And 
Why is it called a cash warehouse? It's been dismantled and stored, but some of you might remember there was an iron door right here behind this curtain here for a, a vault and a safe. And there was a brick uh, structure here that they used as a vault. And back then, this uh, business was set up before there were banks in Calgary. Mm -hmm. So they had to have some place to keep their cash. So it's not unusual that in early businesses in Calgary, you'd find vaults where they kept cash. At the A.E. Cross House in Inglewood, which was Cross's house, there's a vault in the basement there out at uh, the Crandall Hart House in Patterson Heights, where the um, uh, brickyard was, or the brickyard office, where there was a, there's a vault in the basement there, again, because there were no banks, they had to keep cash, they had to have money for payroll, etc. So when this building is eventually relocated, the vault will be put back. It's in storage in C camp uh, off on the uh, Eau Claire Plaza site somewhere. So of course the, uh, the uh, golden years did not last forever. And by the 1920s, the heyday was over. And at that point, uh, the business was sold to Canadian interests. So what you're looking at here is some uh, records from the uh, Eau Claire Fonds at, uh, uh, at the Glenville Archives. It, uh, the company wasn't bankrupt, but the lumber berths were almost bare. It was uh, a logged out. So the company was rechartered. And this was an inventory, an office inventory done at the time. And this is really valuable. This really gives uh, some good information on how this little building was actually used. And here's a bit more information. I'll just put to this last one. So here you can see the most expensive piece of office equipment was the Addy machine, which in 1928 was valued at $500, which would be $8,000 today which I don't know, maybe the most expensive gaming computer would cost 8,000 today, but and so the total equipment in this building was valued uh, at equivalent of $21,000 today. And here's a, a typical office. This is the McCaution storage office uh, uh, up, up in Edmonton. So this building uh, was used as, as an office, cash was held here. And what we've been able to discern is uh, back in this corner, which was the kitchen when it became a cafe, was the manager's office. Uh, this office over here was the accountant's office. And this room here was a general office. And maybe uh, when I'm done and we have can turn the lights on, there's a little ghost on the wall there, a little outline next to the window there where you can see there was some, and what I think there was, a counter there with a, uh, okay. a a divider where people would so people wouldn't come into this part but the public would come to that front to a counter uh, right back there and then the other thing that's interesting here there's this little hatch here into that room we don't know exactly what that was for but maybe that's where cash went uh, went back and forth we're, we're not sure so uh, the last log drive was in 1944, and in 45, the mill closed. And it uh, sat vacant for a few years, but then it became a cafe. And so it's been a cafe pretty much ever since then. It's been a cafe for 68 years, longer than it's been an office for the lumber company. Um, here's a, another early shot of it. Oh, I'll go back here. It was the Cadillac, the center, and then the 1886 Cafe. Um, and here, this is a bird's eye view of Eau Claire showing the cafe, the bus barns, and the smoke stack. So the uh, bus barns were uh, built during the Second World War. They were like um, hangar uh, type structures. And after the uh, Second World War, the city took them over as bus barns. So there was a lot of activity there. So the cafe opened to serve the employees at the bus barns, uh, to serve the employees at uh, the uh, uh, other business in the area, uh, Calgary uh, Motors. And just on a, a personal, I imagine this cafe, when I was a kid, 
my dad had a business in Saskatoon called Polar Refrigeration. And there was a little cafe down the block, a little greasy spoon lunch place that was full of local workers. And there was, I think the woman's name, I'll say it was Marge, maybe I made that up. My brother's here, maybe he remembers this. But it would, I, that's what I imagine this cafe was like uh, uh, at, the, at the time. Whoops, I went too far. Oh yeah, here's another shot. Um, Ken Campbell operated the Cadillac Cafe and eventually then changed the name to the Center Cafe. So, like I said, uh, served uh, uh, the surrounding businesses. Some other owners uh, took it over and operated it until 1975 uh, when the bus barns moved to Spring Gardens. And then the building became vacant. And for, again, the records aren't clear, but for one, maybe two years, people actually lived here. It was home, I can't remember the, uh, the tenant's name but it was used as a home. That's the only time it was ever used as a residence. And so then it became the, uh, eventually became the 1886 Cafe. So this is an article in the paper uh, that tells the story of um, Hemming and McNeil and how they established the 1886 Cafe. So the story is that uh, Hemming uh, was living in Toronto at the time, and the government accidentally and mistakenly sent him two unemployment checks, and that gave him enough money to move to Calgary uh, to find work. And uh, uh, McNeil was from Sydney, Nova Scotia, so he came to Calgary about the same time because Sydney was a uh, dying steel town; there wasn't much work. Calgary was uh, the land of opportunity. So these uh, two guys uh, came to Calgary, and uh, the cafe. Uh, 1982. So Hemming had no experience whatsoever in the restaurant business, but he thought he knew how to cook. And so he took over this restaurant. He team joined up with McNeil, who was mostly a silent partner, who would work here occasionally. For the first wife, I just have to correct myself, it was used for a residence fee. For the first two years in operation, Hemming lived in the basement uh, of the building. And some of you who were here might remember at the time eventually they created a little sort of museum in the basement. They had lots of photos and a few artifacts talking about the, uh, the history of the building. And so perhaps the height of the 1886 fame came during the 1988 Olympics when it was featured in an ad for a visa. And I had a bit of a technical uh, challenge here. You can go online and just Google this and you can see the video on YouTube. I can't play it today, unfortunately. But it was, you know, Visa you featured the 1886 cafe in a television ad. So it was quite a, a popular, uh, popular place. So I eventually met uh, Blaze McNeil and he told me stories of where it was located previously. It was right near the uh, Sheraton Hotel, one of the best hotels in town, where really important people stayed. Movie stars would stay there. And so the concierge over there would send people over to the 1886 Cafe for breakfast. And apparently Brad Pitt had breakfast here once. So <laughs> adds to the historic uh, significance. So um, in uh, 1993, when the Eau Claire market was built, the building had to be moved. So, uh, you know, when you go through the uh, city files, there was correspondence and memos and briefing notes and letters back and forth, what to do with it, maybe move it to Heritage Park, maybe keep it, what should we do with it? Eventually, it was a uh, decision was made to move it. It was moved about 10 feet. And you can see from the slide, it was barely moved at all. But what that did, Prior to that, uh, uh, Hemming and McNeil, like, they had a month-to-month -month lease on buildings. So it was a pretty tenuous uh, tenure that they had in the building. When it was moved, they were able to negotiate a tenure lease. They agreed to invest some money in the building, do some upgrades to the building at the time. And so the 1886 uh, cafe was able to continue. And it, it became a really familiar landmark uh, in the city. 
you know, I'm sure it was on TripAdvisor, there was lots of uh, articles in the newspaper about it. It was a, a well-known spot in Calgary. I think when uh, visitors, uh, when people had visitors come to Calgary, they'd often uh, bring them down to the 1886 cafe. I can see some people uh, nodding. Although you, you probably wouldn't have wanted to see the kitchen. <laughs> Um, yeah, and this this was uh, the inside of the cafe, so it was a, a dripping with uh, with character on the on the inside of the building. Okay, so this is the building in 2015, uh, just before I joined facilities management and when I became involved. You can see at the time it needed some uh, tender loving care. The, the tenants weren't really. Uh, looking after the building. So, you know, I have pictures in my files of the roof. There was literally blue tarps on the roof keeping the rain out. There had been some massive hailstorms that had damaged the roof and it was leaking and the tenants didn't have the money to repair the roof. So we put a brand new, really good quality cedar shingle uh, roof on it back then and then uh, painted the exterior shortly after that. And then in 1921, it was, uh, no, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. <laughs> what, you don't believe me? <laughs> uh, so in anticipation of the renewal of Eau Claire Plaza, the building uh, had to be moved again. Uh, there was some funny elevation changes that had to happen. There's some underground infrastructure that uh, had to go in and so it had to be moved. Now, the greatest risk to a historic building is if it sits vacant. You know, and uh, years ago, I took a course on this, and the stats on fires in vac vacant historic buildings are concerning. So <clears throat> we didn't want the building to sit empty, so we needed to find a use for it. And have the building to be able to function at some use. So C Space stepped up and they agreed to program it for a couple of years while the building uh, was moved to a temporary location. It's on a temporary foundation. There's a temporary heating system. There's a really nice temporary bathroom outside, <laughs> I hear. Uh, so for uh, for so for two years it's uh, it's gonna be here. And there's a beautiful deck around it. And actually I think it's a bit more prominent in this location, and I really, uh, I'm really happy about the, uh, the, the use of it. So, and here's where it's going to move uh, in the future, where the Kids and Co. Uh, daycare company is. That will be demolished in the spring, and eventually the uh, building will go and sit there. And this is you probably this uh, screen's probably not large enough uh, to see this, but this is a plan of the new Eau Claire. Plaza. And the building will be located much close to the river, right next to the pathway. And oh, yeah. I want to get the contract to run that cafe <laughs> because I think it'll be really popular. Now, in heritage conservation, moving a building is always a solution of last resort. You don't like, I'll talk more about this in a bit, but you know, you can always move it to Heritage Park and save it that way. But I think it's important that this building stay in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. This is where it originated. This is where the story of the mill, the early development of Eau Claire is. And this building being here, I think, helps tell that story in the place. I think if it was moved to Heritage Park, you would lose that association. and You would lose something. So it has some value here uh, where it is. So this is uh, just some uh, renderings of it uh, when it's moved. So when it's moved, there's going to be an addition put onto it that has uh, fully accessible, gender-neutral washrooms, janitor room, etc. And the basement will also house the mechanical systems for the splash pad and water park that's going in at Oakland Plaza. So there will be an addition onto it, which is always a tricky thing with heritage buildings. The standards and guidelines that we use say that uh, any additions should be compatible, subordinate, and discernible. So I worked with uh, uh, the designers and dialogue architects. 
to do the best we can to meet those criteria. The little front entry at the front will be gone. There'll be a, a larger front entry there that's wheelchair accessible. The front door will be widened so people with uh, in, in wheelchairs and mobility challenges can be able to get into the building. The city of Calgary has made a real commitment to make every city-owned building as accessible as possible. So I did a lot of work with my colleagues in the city to try to make a city historic buildings as accessible as possible. And sometimes it means you have to make compromises. So the front entry will be widened, and this <coughs> entry where this woman is standing will be widened a bit so a, a wheelchair can get through comfortably. And then the, the, uh, there'll be the door to the outside is where the addition will be. That door will be widened as well. So wheelchairs can uh, uh, maneuver. Here's a, another uh, building showing a wall of the addition. And it uh, doesn't show it here, but this is going to be a lenticular wall. Um, same one over one. Yeah. What it is, it's one of those, as you walk past it, an artist will be engaged oh, yeah, yeah. to paint a mural on this. And as you walk by it, it will change. Oh. And, and some of the discussion that is a great opportunity to tell the story of change of this site as you walk by it. The image will actually change. So I think there's some nice uh, parallels there. Here's a, another building, uh, uh, another image showing the uh, front entry and a patio outside. But it will still be you know, a landmark in Eau Claire Plaza. And I think maybe a bit more of a landmark than it was in its last location but beside the, the barley mill, the fake historic building. Uh, across from uh, the, the market. And then another view. So you can, and there you can see the vault. It's a brick vault that will be uh, reinstated. So I want to talk about buildings as uh, artifacts a bit. So uh, in the conservation world, when you're uh, one of the first things you do when you're looking at a building and you're conserving a building, you write what's called a statement of significance, which just captures the values that I talked about and describes those values. It's not a narrative history. It was built this year and so-and-so lived here and then sold it to Joe Blow who lived here. That's not what it is. It's a succinct narrative that captures the values. But another important part of that is you describe the character defining elements. And those are the elements of the building that need to be retained in order for the building to convey its values. And the story that I used to describe that, it's like if there was the uh, house that Johnny McDonald grew up in and he came back, would he recognize that house? There has to be enough left there to convey the original uh, meaning and uh, feeling of the house. So I'm just some of the character fine. What struck me, you know, I'll show you some images. You know, I'd seen this building when it was full of stuff. The cafe was here with the buffalo head on the wall and framed dollar bills and okay. there's an old end of a bedstead used as a, a a little barrier at the front door that was full of stuff. And the first time I came here when this building was empty I just about plopped. I couldn't believe it. This building is so original. It has barely changed since it was built, and it's intact. You seldom see historic buildings as intact as this one. And if they are, they're probably at Heritage Park. So the uh, pressed tin ceiling and corners here, it's about 98% intact. Uh, the millwork on the walls is completely original and intact. That's the same finish mm -hmm. that was on these walls in 1908. Mm -hmm. So you've got the uh, uh, brick in the vault, and you can see that uh, pattern in the mortar. That's the original. That will be recreated when it's put back up. The exterior siding is the original siding. Now, some of it has been replaced in different spots, and it's Hard to estimate, but you know, I estimated there's somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of the exterior siding is original. And then we've got the original hatch that helps 
you know, someday we'll figure out what that was for. But, um, so I'm just gonna read from this here, uh, what I've got here. Says, a building is a result of problem solving and decision making. It reflects a series of choices based on needs, use, cultural values, location, materials, technology, economics, and regulations. And it must be seen in the context of location, geography, climate, natural resources, trades, materials, and construction. So th this building shows evidence of all of that, I mean, evidence of the resources and the trades and the craftsmanship and the technology and the values at the time. It's very rough and ready, you know, it's a real basic building. That's what they needed at the time. You saw the first building that they built, that was even more basic. So this is a, 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 a Matterport recording is a, that uh, Dialogue did when it was empty. So when I came into it when it was empty, I told you how, how striking it was. You know, this little uh, uh, ceramic tile server here, that will be taken out when it's moved. And the, there's some, some of the walls behind me are painted. Those will be restored. Uh, the tin ceiling will be maintained. There's a few little pieces that are missing that we'll figure out and see if perhaps we can get uh, replicas of the original press tile to replace it. If not, we'll find something like it. Uh, here's another uh, shot of the interior. And this is the Peter Prince House. This is an artifact. So, you know, the heritage uh, parks, they're really popular. Um, you know, Heritage Park, everybody loves Heritage Park. And you know, I love historic houses. And you get to see them in their original configuration. Are they completely authentic? Uh, I don't know. And everything that's preserved, every Heritage Park, there's biases that are inherent there. And, you know, I'm sure at Heritage Park there's lots of colonial biases at Heritage Park. And a lot of uh, places, museums, galleries, parks, they're starting to re-examine that. I know I've uh, traveled in the southern United States and some of the plantation sites. You're starting to see much more uh, evidence of telling the story of slavery mm -hmm. in those places. So, so, uh, so I, I prefer to buildings to stay in their original location and to be used as a contemporary building that functions today. Sometimes you have to make changes to that building, but you know, I would I prefer to, here, to here. see that. Um, now, building is artifact, how you treat it. Um, now this is a, it's in a vitrine. This is the form, I have to read this. Uh, former home of the SS commander at a Nazi, the Nazi concentration camp, Westerbrook in the Netherlands. That's where Anne Frank was detained before she was sent to Auschwitz. And uh, Overing architecture, uh, the Overing house, it's designated a National Historic Monument in 1994. So the glass cover is intended to protect it from further decline and weathering. It seems kind of extreme to me. You know? The house is maintained, it works. But this isn't the only example of this. Uh, this is a uh, a theater in Quebec, I can't read on my slide what it is, but this was a, a brutalist building. And a lot of buildings of this period, they were experimental. The technology was experimental. So this building was not weathering very well. It had to be protected. And so uh, what uh, LeMay Architect did is they enclosed it in a glass tree. So the building in behind it is completely original not much has changed. It's been you know, refurbished and restored, but it's still the original building on the interior. Now, I, I think you've lost something, but I, when we're, we're talking about this building and net zero, and how do you bring down the energy use of a building like this, you're, it's gonna be really hard to do. You'd have to have walls like a foot thick. So would it be appropriate to put this building in a glass vitrine for energy conservation purposes? It's an uh, interesting issue. And he uh, mentioned the uh, 
on policy in Englewood. This was an early proposal. They were gonna put a cover on and I've seen another proposal where they're actually gonna enclose the whole thing. And I see Sarah is not in it. She would know about this. Um, so there's uh, uh, interesting ways to approach uh, buildings as artifacts. I prefer to see them as more living artifacts. The, the Hunt House is now a little house museum. And so why are we preserving the lumber building? And why are we uh, using it as a cafe? <clears throat> well, in conservation, one of the principles is when you're reusing a building, you try to find a compatible use, something that requires as few changes as possible. This building has been used as a cafe for almost 70 years. So it will continue in use as a food and beverage service. You know, some people are, oh, well, it could be like a fancy restaurant. But, you know, it's going to be like a grab-and-go restaurant. Just needs a, a basic kitchen. Uh, when you convert a historic building to a full-service restaurant, it has a huge impact on it because of all the ventilation and fire safety that you have to put in. This building will be sprinklered. I'm not against that. Wooden historic buildings, you know, it's a good, uh, good uh, safeguard for them. So um, I know that, that some uh, people in my field are, are skeptical of this moving a building hither and yon, uh, repurposing it, putting an addition on it. But I think Calgarians will continue to love this building. They'll continue to value it. Uh, for another 120 years. So that's my, those are my stories today. So thank you all for coming. Uh, any, any questions or uh, comments? Uh, Harry will answer them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Daryl. Okay. I quite yeah. apart from the building, but you mentioned Strom as one of the first owners, I think. Yeah. Is any relation to the premier? I no, I don't think so. There's, it's so hard to find information. Even uh, Isaac Kendall Kerr, I couldn't find a lot of information on him. I couldn't even find an obituary online. So <coughs> I, I, that's an interesting question, but maybe you'll research it some day. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so Daryl, um, you mentioned that there are little turrets at the top. Is there something up there? Uh, or is yeah, it all just fake? No, no. No, there's an attic up there. Okay. And so I, I, have, I was going to put pictures up there. But I, I love those spaces. There's a ladder here. You're not allowed to go up it. But it's just, you know, bare lumber, you know, rafters and cross ties and little um, uh, dormers to bring light in there. I'm not sure why, because that space has never been used for now. It's been used for storage sometimes, but it's just empty attic space up there. Um, Lisa? Yeah, I'm just wondering... Were the floors originally painted? Because there's like little bits of paint on the floor. So. That's a good question. I, I don't know. It's likely it would have been painted. They would have been varnished or finishes. There's some yellow varnish over here. Like but how, how, how would they be restored? Just like as is, or would you put well, that? No. Well, we, we've done, we've done a, a preliminary evaluation of the floor. And you can see there's patches on it. Parts of it have been replaced. Parts of it are really worn and kind of dangerous. So when it's restored, I think the, the first approach will be to give it a really a, a good sanding, sand it down, and then do a more detailed evaluation and replace what needs to be replaced, and then put a new, uh, you know, it had some kind of clear finish on it that showed the wood grain. And so we'll put a new finish on it, but something that's really durable and wears well, because it's a commercial building and you can see how, how warm it is from being used as a cafe for 70 years, so. When is it supposed to be moved back? Sometime next year. Next year. It's, that, it's complicated, you know, the city has to acquire the kids in cold building, get a demolition permit uh, approved, uh, tender the demolition, the demolition needs to be done, the site needs to be prepared. But the target is to move the building back onto a new foundation sometime next spring, and then over 2024, put the new addition on it, put the machine room in the basement with all the uh, fountain machinery, etc. And then, fingers crossed, by the end of 24, 
uh, there'll be a bylaw at City Council to formally designate and protect the building as a municipal historic resource. So fingers crossed, but it's coming. Yes? I can only imagine there is a bit of arm twisting in getting an artist residency into this space. Uh, I don't know from who, and maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe it was a great idea on the part of C Space or Dialogue or whoever. I think it's a great idea. Um, I'm curious about two things. I'm curious about what your greatest nightmare is for artists to do in this building. And I'm also curious about the ways in an ideal world that you see artists working with heritage spaces. Like what's the best, so basically the worst and best cases for you. Well, the worst scenario, and when I came by here, there was an artist working, and I thought, oh my God, is he welding in there? That's, <laughs> That's me, one of my <coughs> worst scenarios. <coughs> but something I uh, struggle with is we're going to lose more heritage buildings. That's inevitable in a place like Calgary. We're going to lose heritage buildings. So how do you commemorate a heritage building that you've lost in a new development on site? Other than putting a plaque on it or salvaging bits and pieces and pasting them on. And I think that's where an artistic approach would, would come in and that commemorative and what does memory mean and how to memorialize these buildings. That's why I think this lenticular wall here is quite interesting, how that can, will be used to tell the story of transition and change. Because this building and the site and the city has gone through a huge amount of change. So I don't know if that answers questions, but it's a response. <laughs> Sarah. Um, this isn't related to this, but the picture that you showed of Fort Calgary with the indigenous community outside, um, oh, I was in a meeting at Fort Calgary in the meeting room, and that picture was always on the wall. And the meeting was with the representatives from Treaty 7. I was asked to take it down. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not, it's a composite. Uh, somebody took a Nobody knows who or when, but it's kind of this romantic, stereotypical uh, image of the relationship between the Northwest Mounted Police and the Indigenous community, and they are very offended by it. So, just thank, thank you. Well, and now yeah. you say that, when, you know, when I look at it, yeah, they're all sitting down, they're so yeah. subjugated. So it's a cut and paste picture of the romantic. <laughs> Maybe, uh, and the indigenous community was never allowed inside the fort. Mm -hmm. And at another meeting, when they, they were invited, they thanked me for inviting them because it was the first time they felt welcome inside the fort. Mm -hmm. well, thanks, so. Maybe so, there should be a, an annotation on the photo with the archives. Yeah, because it's very interesting. I don't think it should be destroyed. No. Like, to me, it's very interesting picture because it is representative of that relationship well and time. and it tells a, a story that we don't yeah. and we're not aware yeah. of yeah and then if you look at it they all, were also offended by um the, the sort of stereotypical uh, image as well of starvation and as they always said to me we're still here well, that, that's why I mentioned the uh, stories I heard from uh, Elden Weasel Child at the opening. That was so exciting to me to, 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 to learn that. And it's something that as researchers and conservationists that we've ignored yeah. for a long time. And the stories that uh, they... Uh, whatever his name was, I told you he wrote that narrative. And there was a lot about First Nations, and it was, you know, today would be completely politically incorrect, but it's valuable to read those stories and to, to learn from them and look at them in, in a different way than we've been used to looking at them. So thanks for that. I'll, yeah. I'll remove and the then, slide. I'll find another slide. And the other, <laughs> the other thing I wanted to, I think, correct my understanding was it's part of the Hudson's Bay Post. It's not a Métis cabin. The Métis cabin is now on the site, it's in behind now. Yeah, and, and 
So there was a Hudson's Bay post where the dean was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, you, you, thank you for that. I remember now because I think it was Lauren Simpson did some detailed photographic well, and historical and analysis. And McGrath to meet this gentleman two and a half hours later gave us a picture mm -hmm. that verified it was part of the system. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah, and the Hudson's Bay factor lived in there, mm -hmm. and the post um, was located. And how is it used today? Are there like school kids coming to visit yeah. it? Or? And you can uh, have a private exclusive dinner in there. You can get married in there. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Again. Again. Yeah, trying to make it relevant to the site. Right? right, and give it some, well, you know, if you want to conserve a historic building other than in the heritage park, it has to have some productive use. Mm -hmm. And often that's some kind of economic use. So that's why, like, this building being reused as food and beverage stores, I think is a great idea because <coughs> it will make money, and then that will provide some money to make sure the building is maintained and used. As soon as you know, to lease it at a reasonable rate, that will help pay for the maintenance of it. Yeah, and that was the thinking on the dean house. Uh, yes, because it never really been restored. And Jerry raped literally. Yeah. There was things being held together with duct tape. So it required a huge house. capital investment yeah. to restore it. And it couldn't have happened without some, a private partnership. Right. Okay. Any other comments, questions? Okay, well, one more. I just yeah. wanted to get a clarification on what year you thought that this building was actually constructed. Because it was 1986, it was maybe 1908. 1908, 1912. Okay, okay, thank you. So, so the, the, the camps where they harvested the wood or whatever, is there anything, I don't know how many words there were, but how, is there anything permanent there left of those situations? No, no, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. And there was other settlements. I mean, the research, there was Silver City was there because they were doing some you know, silver exploration there. I don't think there's nothing left that I'm aware of. And you, you said the bus barns were moved to somewhere else. Where's the somewhere else? Well, well the, the, the well the, the buildings themselves weren't moved. The function of the bus barns was yeah. moved to uh, Spring Gardens at the time. Northeast. Mm -hmm. So on the yeah. on the, the nose where they currently are. Yeah, and then, and then and then the bus break? barns over by Stampede Park were break? built later. Yeah. So, uh, so Spring Gardens is where. Uh, okay. Well, Are you going to stick around for a little bit? Maybe we can. Yeah, yeah, stick around for a bit. But again, thank you very much for your attention and your questions.